You know, isn't it funny how a week of time can expose on whether we have faith in Christ Jesus or not? You know, all it takes is an event or a circumstance to reveal where we truly stand. All it takes is something to hair out of our control to expose us as people of little faith. You know, this past week has probably been one of those weeks for some in here, maybe some people that we know. But I can especially tell you it's been one of those weeks for Lori and I. We've had our shares of storms that came up, and uh, I'm so thankful that they did. And I say that with that easy smile that we have when we go through those times, right? Um, I will say today I'm not going to be going verse by verse through Scripture as I normally would like to, but it is my hope that we can relate to the disciples in that event that Diane read. And I will read another account to it as well. But our goal today is to keep Christ Jesus above all else. So in doing so, uh, if you want to follow along in this reading, it's uh, 1508 in your Pew Bible, or Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. And I'll give you a little bit of time. That's page 1508 again. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey Him. It's just a powerful reading, isn't it? You know, this passage helps us to see some things about our world that have not changed since that fall in the Garden of Eden. And those things that have not changed is that this world is full of storms. They are. And so when we look at what what type of storms are in this world, we can look to the definition of storm. In the, and I love this dictionary that I, I should be a salesman for, as I've said many times. 1828 in Old Webster Dictionary, uh, there's, I think, 11 definitions for storm, but we're going to look at two. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is a violent wind. And that's exactly what the disciples came under that day. That's exactly what they experienced on that lake. But all of us here today may relate better to the following storms, as Diane read, a squall. And I was afraid that many of you here may not know what that meant, but I didn't know it was in that Mark passage, which is a great thing. All of us may relate to tornadoes or straight-line winds or microbursts. That's, I don't know if they call that a tornado up here when they can't classify it, but that's what they say in southern Illinois, microbursts. Typhoons, hurricanes, you know, we can think of these things as storms. And I want to ask a question, and I don't need a response, but just think about it in your heart and in your mind. Have you ever had the pleasure of being in the middle of one of these storms? A tornado, a hurricane, or what have you. I see some people shaking their heads. How did it make you feel? God, did it make you feel out of control? Did it make you feel helpless, without hope? At the mercy of the power and the strength of that storm? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But we're not here today to talk about tornadoes and hurricanes and the storms of nature. We're here to talk about the next definition of storms, which I feel this is referring to. Even though the storm that we understand gives us that vivid image of what the disciples face, we're going to look at two other words. The first one is affliction. Okay, affliction, the state of constant pain given to the body or to the mind which causes the recipient to grieve, to experience unhappiness, or to feel great distress. The second word that I want us to think about is adversity, which is an event or series of events that causes a person to turn from success or from their desired result. So both these storms, both these storms can cause the recipient to lose faith or to lose hope. And you know, the truth is that many of us have experienced 
times like these in our lives. And some have experienced them more than they would want to or would like to. You know, these are the times where we lose faith or we lose our trust because of the unknown fear that we experience or because the situation is out of our control a little bit, which causes our anxiety level to rise beyond our control or which may cause our mind to race beyond the here and now and then those dreaded what ifs come into play, right? What if this happens or what if this doesn't happen? Then. Once all that is done, we experience one of two things. We either experience mental overload where we shut down, or we experience what some people do, they lash out. <laughs> okay? We either shut down or we lash out. But, you know, this week, Lori and I experienced some of these. And, you know, there's the joy of marriage, where we get to experience some of these storms together. And Lori's laughing because she knows exactly where this is headed. She knows that I'm going to share about the example of us traveling to Chicago. I don't know how many of you knew, but I had an interview in Chicago with the Central Conference. And we generally take the train because we do not like the traffic. Okay? I shared with Rick that we were going to stay in a hotel, and so we didn't have to fight the traffic on Monday. But we forgot one thing. We forgot that Lily had no one to stay with her, our little dog. So we, <laughs> we stayed at home, and we took the car, okay? We took the car. And normally, I drive our family everywhere because I don't want Lori to have stress, okay? That, uh, I take it, and I, I love it. Right. So, <laughs> so, when we go to big cities, Lori drives and I navigate because I'm saying this, and Dave, record this. You can edit it and play it back to me whenever you want. Lori is the better driver in the big city. She is. But I am the better navigator. And that's why we work well as a team. You know, the system has always worked for us until this trip. Until this trip. Oh, gosh. A trip that neither of us will ever forget. And we can smile and laugh, but we weren't smiling and laughing. You know, it's amazing how we get off the off-ramp, or the on-ramp, sorry, the on-ramp to the Interstate 57 headed north, and our attitude towards our spouse resembles the amount of traffic, right? So as we are headed north, there's no traffic. Lori's like, I love you, Dave. And I'm like, I love you too, Lori. Gosh, lovebirds, that's what we are. Gosh. You know, she even loved me so much, she was willing to listen to a, um, a little sermon that I had to prepare for the interview, and she graciously did that. You know, we were able to talk with each other, we were able to laugh with each other, which was great, and that was until we got closer to Chicago, okay? And the moment we got closer to Chicago, our ride turned from that calm and fun ride to a tense and full of what-if ride, right? You know, what to say that Lori was not in the mood for small talk. I could see her white knuckles on the steering wheel. <laughs> her back and her shoulders were hurting from the stress of driving. And as we got closer and closer to Chicago, the traffic just suffocated and got more difficult to navigate. And then our ride turned from tense and full of what if to a storm that I will never forget. I will never forget it. Let's just say that I learned not to point to an exit. I learned not to point to an exit instead of telling my lovely wife, this is the exit that we need to take. Okay? Because in that moment, my sweet, loving, caring, compassionate wife had an out-of-body experience. <laughs> Where all of the tension, all of the fear of the unknown, all of the what if, all of her stress came out, and it was directed right at me. <laughs> Gosh, I deserved every bit of it. You know that? I deserved every bit of it. So I want to thank Lori for her being a good sport. We didn't get to hear everything that happened in that car. That's for our ears. But because she was such a good sport, I will share another example of the storms that pop up. And you know, mine won't be near as funny because everyone can understand the, the marriage and a car ride and how well we get along in those situations. But 
I'm going to share about that same day and how I lost faith. Okay? It's amazing. So, as I was going to the Central Conference for that interview, I was very confident. I asked myself every single question that they could possibly ask me. I was so prepared, it wasn't even funny. I was confident in the paper. I was confident in my profile as a minister, all the things that they would ask me. Lori even asked me, so Dave, how do you feel about this? And I told her, I said, why would God call me to his church in Paxton and not have the denomination that they support license me? Why would he do that? That would be a sick joke, wouldn't it? So, in my confidence, all of a sudden I heard David Parker. <laughs> and I walked into the room and I began to buckle. I began to buckle a little bit. I felt that anxious, the anxiety, the, the what ifs, the tensions, as they started asking me questions. And they asked me questions that I prepared for. And I was like, uh, 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 answering not how I should. And all I could think in my head was how I failed that interview. That's all I could think about. Then all of a sudden they kicked me out. They're like, go sit in the waiting room. <laughs> while we deliberate whether or not you're worthy. So I went to Lori and I said, hey, how long was I in there? And she said, 35 minutes. I was like, oh my goodness, 35 minutes? The interview was supposed to last 45. What did I do? Did I fail them? Did I fail this interview? So all these what ifs came to mind. And then all of a sudden, the receptionist, her phone rang. And I'm thinking, that's got to be about me. <laughs> They're probably calling security to us and me out of here or something, right? Gosh. And then all of a sudden, they, they told me in the room it would be 15 minutes. And Lori's looking at her watch going, 15 minutes? Dave, it's been 25. So they've been delivering, deliberating for 25 minutes while I'm sitting there, have no clue what's going on or what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, you know what? We just moved into the parsonage. <laughs> We just moved into the parsonage. Now I'm going to have to call Don Wolf and ask him for the rental back. You just installed me as your pastor. You just installed me. I'm going to have to call Moody Bible Institute and go full time because I am about to get fired. Right? These what ifs that pop up. It's amazing. And all of a sudden, I hear my name again. And they call me back in, and Lori is nervous as I'll get out. <laughs> it's hilarious. So, and I was too. I'm not just picking on you. I was horrible. I walk back in, and I'm trying to read their face. You know how it is. You're trying to look, what do you got for me here? So then all of a sudden, they say, Dave, we're going to recommend that you are licensed. They prescribe me with the tools needed to better understand the determination. They prayed over me, and then all of a sudden... It's time to leave and face round two of that Chicago traffic, so, which took us an hour and 45 minutes to get through on the way home. But these are the storms that we're talking about. Do you understand or can you relate to any of these in your life? I would say maybe, probably the husband and wife maybe not seeing eye to eye in the car, because that never happens. So, you know... By relating to these examples, we put ourselves right into the shoes of the disciples as they face that storm on the lake in Scripture. And I know some of you are saying, well, Dave, your storms that took place that week are nothing compared to being on a boat with waves coming on you to where you're going to die. You're absolutely right. But these, that is not the experience the disciples had. Okay? That is not why Christ rebuked them. But what this does, this story of, or not story, the scripture tell us, it tells us that the disciples were very, very human and nothing more. It reveals that to us. You know, we must understand that the men and women that are in this book are just as human as we are. And I know I say this a lot, but sometimes we have this holier-than-thou perception of these men and women who are flesh and blood just like us. We have to break that. We have to break that. Because they are still very human, just as these disciples were very human. We read that account, and we think that they're supposed to be stronger than a rock in that storm. But they're just like us. They're just like us. You know, those disciples reacted exactly how each and every one of us would have in that situation. Dave Durham is a storm chaser by heart, by heart, and has done it in the past. 
<laughs> Let me correct that. Due to circumstances out of his control, he's no longer a storm chaser. All right. So I love chasing storms. I love tornadoes. I love watching them from a very far distance, okay, as some of us may. But I can tell you, even the crazy people like Dave and I would have shivered and trembled in that boat because there's no escape. As you chase a tornado, guess what you can do? Turn around your car and drive the other way, right? They had no escape. So why did Christ rebuke them for their little faith? To me, they forgot of the scripture. It does not say this. So this is me, okay? This is me. And I'm thinking of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 13 through 18. And I'll read it. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything of their future. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in the righteousness, and the wicked living in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked, and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp one and, and not let go of the other. Whoever fears, the God will, whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. So, just as many of us forget about our faith in Christ in the midst of our storms, we do. It's, it's human for us to do that. The disciples forgot who, in fact, was with them in the middle of their storm. They forgot that only God can straighten what He's made crooked. They forgot that there will always be bad times with the good. Even though Christ was with them always, they, I don't know if they knew that at the time or not, but we do. We know that, that Christ is with us no matter what. Their current storm, they did not understand, was temporary. Okay? We always get this flopped up. We think that the current storm that we are in is permanent, and our God is not. And we need to think of it the other direction. The disciples forgot about their God as the extremes caused them to fear. And instead of their fear overrunning their judgments, they forgot to remember their reverent fear of their God, which keeps them constant and secure. Because of this, they turned to Jesus. And I, I can't imagine being in this situation. We know that they weren't going to Him to say, hey, fix this. Right? Fix this, what's going on. They were going to Him as children, to the Father going... Tell me it's okay. Tell me it's going to be okay, Father. And boy, were they destroyed when he just goes, wind, sea, calm. Right? Those of you who've been through a storm, how powerful would it have been to have someone right next to you who goes, ah, tornado, no more. And it's just calm. God. Where would the credit go? It has to go to God, if you think about it. So, this storm did an amazing job to reveal some things about the disciples. It revealed their little faith, just as it would have revealed every single one of ours. It would have. And it also revealed something about Christ. And to set this up, um, I'm going to talk about the abundant movies, the books, the comic books, video games, and what have you that portray common everyday human beings, okay? <laughs> that have supernatural powers. I think it's important for us to see this. You know, the first thing I think of is always Star Wars, and I'm sorry for those of you who don't like Star Wars. But I think of Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader as they control the Force, and there's only one power that they have that I'm interested in, and that is the Jedi mind trick, okay? Those of you who know Star Wars know how powerful this is. And just think about it. You know, anytime your boss wants you to stay late for work and you don't want to, you say, I am not the employee you're looking for. And then the boss just goes away. Okay? Husband, when your wife is upset with you, which never happens because we're perfect, it never happens. You say, I am not the husband you are looking for, and they go away. It's me. Moms, when your child says mom 27,000 times in 10 minutes, you say, I am not the mom you are looking for, and they go away. It's a neat thing. It's a neat power. I pray for this, even though I know it's not biblical, 
and it's not in the cards for me. Okay, but it would be a neat thing to have. You know what? Another comic book hero that you look to is Storm. Okay, Storm. Um, from the X-Men. Uh, he's part human, half part mutated. He can control the elements. He can make tornadoes appear, hurricanes, whatever. And she can do this to use against her enemies or to protect them. And, you know, that's what makes me think of Christ in them. Not that he's a superhero, and I don't want us to think that. It's that he is, in fact, human. There's parts of him that are, in fact, human. And it's never evident like it is in this passage. It says Jesus was tired. Tired. Okay, imagine what thousands of people would do to you as you're teaching to them. It would drain you, right? You would need to retreat. You would need to go into the boat and to the other side of the lake to where they can't get to you, just so you can recharge. You know, the other thing that reminds me that Jesus is in fact human is that he slept. Okay, in those movies, how many superheroes actually take a nap? I never saw Darth Vader take a nap, or Luke Skywalker, or any of them. But he, Jesus needs to sleep. It's the human side of him, just like you and I. I even love the account that Diane read. He slept on a cushion. I just find that really neat and a neat little tidbit to the story. But the other part that this reveals to us is that Christ is, in fact, divine. You know, Jesus was perfectly calm, not worried, not stressed or anxious as, he would, as we would be because he rested in his Father's perfect plan, his Father's equipping, his Father's authority over all the elements that was given to him. And then he rebukes the wind and the waves to the point of being completely calm. You know, I love the disciples in this because you see exactly their disbelief when they say, what kind of man is this? What kind of man is this? He's nothing like we've ever seen before. But they still didn't get it. They still did not get or were unable to wrap their minds around the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Not a mere teacher. Not a mere man. Not just their friend, but their Lord and Savior. So in closing, in closing, I want to share with you uh, another story. And I... It's an illustration, but it's true one. And, it, you know, this whole sermon has reminded me, or taken me back to 2013 when I preached at the 4th of July. And I use this example for not understanding God's will, but I hope you see the storm and you see God's provision in the storm that we may not see. So I'll begin. Basically, in World War II, there was a U.S. Marine that was fighting with his unit and was separated somehow. And by being separated, he had to take cover somewhere because he heard the enemy coming. So he went up on a ridge and he saw a series of caves where he picked out the best cave where he felt he could hide the best and just hunkered down right there. And hearing the enemy getting closer, he prayed to his Lord. He said, Lord, if it be your will, please protect me, whatever your will, though. I love you and thank you. Amen. So in the time after the prayer, all of a sudden, he sees a spider go up in the opening of the cave and start to weave a web. And in his dismay, he's like, Lord, I'm asking for protection, and you send me a spider? You must have some type of sense of humor there, Lord. So as he goes on and goes on, and the enemy is getting closer and closer, they check out the cave right next to him, and he gets his gun ready because he's about ready to make his last stand. In that time frame, the spider completed the web, and the enemy came, looked at that cave, and went the other way. No, he did not have the Jedi mind trick. He did not say, this is not the cave you're looking for. It was God who gave a spider and a web that was as powerful as a brick wall that protected that soldier. Isn't that neat how we think in the midst of our storms? Isn't that neat? And the... Oh, God. I'm, I'm just going to be real. The sad part is, is that we do not see the provision that God has already given us to face. We don't see it. It's always after the fact, after the storm is over, then we go, Oh! Oh, that's what you wanted me to learn. 
gosh, we can be stubborn people, can't we? <laughs> oh, goodness. You know, as we face these storms day to day, as we face these storms today, we do have a choice in how we react to them and respond. Will we choose to rest in the little faith like the disciples and suffer through the storm? Where we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, but do not believe that He is the master of all things and in control of all things? Where we feel that we must overcome this storm with our power? Or will we choose to rest in full faith and weather the storm? Where, where we remember that God is in fact with us, where the disciples do not remember that. They do not remember that God was with them in, in the middle of their storm. You know, we talk a lot about anxieties, fears, what if, and they're very real. As I believe Pete said last week, he talked about medication and how much that's being prescribed when it comes to these fears, these anxieties. And there is a cure. And I'm not saying that I have the answer. I don't. Christ is the answer to those things. I struggled with anxiety, fear, what if for years, and only when Christ humbled me, only when the Spirit got my attention, did I go from living in a storm to experiencing the only peace that Christ can give, which is His abundant peace, His abundant glory, His abundant salvation for all those who call upon His name. And there's no better life to live than to rest in Christ Jesus for salvation. Let's go, Lord, and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we're so thankful for your word today. We're so thankful for the, the examples of the disciples and how their faith faltered or fractured. And we can identify with them, Lord, as we face our trials, our tribulations. Lord, help us remember among these storms that we should remember that you are always with us. You are never leave us. That you are our strength and our courage. And that you have a perfect plan, a perfect result for each and every one of us among our storms. So Lord, encourage each and every person that's here today, no matter what they're going through, that you are with them. That alone brings peace, Lord. Help us to see it. Help us to experience it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to do something a little different again. We're going to sing a praise and worship song as our closing song. So if you would, please stand, and we'll close with number 26, Never Let Go. Thank you.
Thank you.